And do you think that then, in a funny way, the extreme uh, fundamentalism, if you're going to have modernity, that's that's actually the the religion that makes sense for it, as opposed to the kind of Anglican gentle anything goes type thing, which seemed to be a nice compromise and the kind of thing that most people could live with because it didn't seem to matter, <laughs> didn't seem to have any grip. Well, for me, um, this sort of fundamentalism is one reaction. I think it's disastrous. Mm. And um, it leads basically to a war of all against all. Um, whatever your particular unit is, your particular uh, subsect or church or whatever, or to a certain extent, the United States of America, you become, um, you know, God's kingdom on earth. Everyone is, else is uh, damned and wrong, and you are saved. Um, but it's a, a terribly negative and, in the end, counterproductive philosophy um, and filled based on hatred, really, and, and uh, but self-regard. The, the wonder of Anglicanism, and I'm glad you brought it up, because, um, uh, I mean, I, I remember a story of, told by one of my friends who, who said, um, he, he was being recruited into the army and you had to write down what your religion was. And so he said, well, I'm, I'm an atheist. And the, the recruiting sergeant said, that, that's no good. Uh, what you mean is you're an Anglican. <laughs> <laughs> so basi basically, um, the, the, the wonder, uh, uh, as has often been pointed out, even by church divines in the Church of England, is that Anglicanism is basically agnosticism. Uh, it's basically a sort of, as I often put it, if you have a God-shaped hole, supposing everyone in a monotheistic society like ours has to have a religion. I mean, we have the religious gene in the back of our neck. And so we need, we need that space, that God-shaped hole filled. Now you can fill it with fundamentalism or you can fill it with this or that. What Anglicanism does is fill it, fill it with cotton wool. Nothing extreme, nothing excluded, nothing included. So when I listen and talk to many of my friends in these interviews who I say, what religion are, are you? And he's, they say, well, you know, I like going to church services and, you know, in a, a moments of panic or fear, I, I may throw up a prayer or so on, but I don't really believe most of the time or even pay any attention. So God is there somewhere, maybe when you need him. It's like a child, you know, just most of the time, don't, not worrying, but in the evening or in the dark, sort of suddenly feeling they need their parents or something. And so Anglicanism, as it was developed in its tolerant form in England after the Reformation, became something which could accommodate anything. And um, another sort of story, which I think my grandmother subscribed to and may have told me, was that um, you know you when you were having a dinner and your servants were present, uh, you didn't talk about religion in front of the servants because it would shock them, because they would then probably discover that you really didn't believe in any of this stuff. So the people who even um, I mean, I was in Cambridge in the, the uh, um, late, well, in the middle, uh, middle to late uh, 20th century, when there were books coming out written by bishops and others questioning whether you really needed a God mm. within Anglicanism. And, you know, there was a great hoo-ha about this. They're all the bit, it was the bishops of Durham. <laughs> that was right. They're all coming uh, out of Durham, uh, <laughs> Bishop Jenkins of Durham. Yeah. I mean, uh, his son, yeah, interestingly, uh, is an anthropologist, Tim Jenkins, and is um, the dean of uh, Cambridge College, and uh, is the primary lecturer on Nietzsche in Cambridge University, is a philosopher and an anthropologist. So the fact that he's 
the Bishop of Durham's son is attracted to Nietzsche is perhaps um, uh, is surprising. Yeah. But basically, Anglicanism is what we all need. We need, it's the closest we have to the sort of fuzzy uh, hodgepodge that you have in China and so on, where you don't necessarily have a God or not. I mean, do you, do you think it has something, also one of the things that always struck me when I was growing up, because I was brought up Anglican in that same sense, and I like the music, and I like uh, I like some of the kind of ritual bits of it, you know, kind of, uh, but, it, but it struck me often when I was reading the Bible, I didn't really believe it, but I, I liked it for the poetry of it, I liked some of the stories, and it seems that when I read uh, your autobiography, uh, Wordsworth and the Romantics, um, and poetry and, and the arts, very, very important. It seems as though the Anglican, that that kind of religion works in pretty much the same way as perhaps the English treat the arts as well. Uh, it allows you for some sort of um, private sense of mystery and wonder and awe, but it's kind of private. It's not, it, it doesn't do, do anything much more than delight you on the, like you say, in the moments when you feel a bit of a crisis or you, you know, if you're a bit depressed, you read a bit of, Kafka or something like that and you think oh, yeah, that's that's how it is uh, but it doesn't go any further than that is so do you think that the way that when we talk about re-enchanting ourselves I mean this isn't really a hidden uh, injury this is more like how how, how we we aren't injured but the way that um, Anglicanism and the way that English treat painting and poetry and that kind of thing is 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 actually one of the ways in which the injury of not having God is is dealt with. Yes, I think it is. I mean, it, I hadn't thought of it particularly, but if you look at all the great English poets, particularly the Romantics, but even back to John Donne and the metaphysicals and even Milton, who is supposed to be a Puritan, but he's, he's quite Anglican, um, if, and back to Shakespeare. They're basically all Anglicans. None, you know, you don't think of Keats or Shelley or Wordsworth or any of these people as extreme uh, in their religion at all. God is sometimes vaguely there, but not in any fierce form. And that which you find in um, poetry, I mean, with the same in literature. I mean, if you said, where is God in the great tradition of English novels. Where is God in Defoe, in Richardson, in Austen, uh, in Dickens? He's nowhere there. I mean, the, the literature is singularly devoid. And he, when he is there, he's usually being mocked by Trollope or George Eliot in Cas you know, Casaborn and the rest. Mm -hmm. So basically, the literary tradition of England and of course the philosophical tradition and Hume and Scots is singularly unconcerned and uninterested in God. But as you point out, and if you look at French or Italian or Spanish painting right up to the 19th century, it's filled with God. I mean, the much of the artwork is representations of religious themes and and so on, even up to you know Rubens and and so on. Um, and then you think of the English, the greatest English period of art, which is the 18th century, Constable and Turner and so on. Where is God there? N nowhere. And when you look at Hogarth, he's was exactly. well, he's... anti anti God, if anything, he's yeah. uh, critical of anything. So, and the satirical. I mean, again, you know. Pope and other poets, if if God is there at all, he's being laughed at mildly, gently. Mm. Um, even the beginning of um, my favourite uh, Pope poem, um, Know then thyself, presume not God to scan. Mm. Forget about God. Mm. The proper study of mankind is man. So in the philosophy, art, literature, poetry, and even the buildings, I mean, the slightly religious tradition of medieval, well, strong religious tradition of King's College Chapel and so on, soon evaporates into this purely secular architecture, no reference to the otherness. So England is very Anglican, 
and there has been. And this perhaps helps to explain the, uh, this curious contrast because um, America kept the, the sort of Puritan tradition and then veered back to fundamentalism. The English are very notoriously a-religious. I mean, church attendance is almost nil now. And they're very accommodating to other. The English empire was because of, that's another feature of it, because of its Anglicanism, the French, the Italians, Portuguese, when they went out and started uh, finding all these natives, they killed them or made them into Catholics. The English went out to India and elsewhere, and they said, well, your religion is your own business. You know, we don't mind as long as you pay your taxes and don't kill each other. Um, so basically, it's much more tolerant to other creeds um, and so on.